Hello everyone, my name is Joseph S. and uh, I'm excited to talk to you about a new method for learning your presentations with multivariate time series. It is based on a transformer framework. First, what do we mean by multivariate time series? Well, simply put, it's just a group of synchronous variables which evolve as a function. So this can be the result of simultaneously recording different physical quantities. However, Despite the presence of the word time in the terminology, more generally, uh, we refer to we can refer to a group of dependent variables aligned with respect to any common independent variable as a multivariate time series. As a more classic example of multivariate time series, we see here simultaneous measurements of different atmospheric conditions, um, which can be the concentration of different molecules, in the atmosphere, the temperature, pressure the amount of rainfall or the wind speed. And now what we are trying to predict as a task here is an extrinsic regression task is uh, different scalars, which we believe can be uh, can depend on this measure. For example, this would be the concentration of fine particulate matter. We now look at an example of classification for multivariate time series. So. Here, the independent variable is frequency, and the different variables are basically different bands of the power spectrum of audio recording of insects that pass through a sensor. The objective is to identify which species out of the 10 different species of insect. Okay, so more generally, we can see that multivariate time series are ubiquitous in science, medicine, finance, engineering, and lots of industrial applications. And often there is an abundance of data, but unfortunately, the label data, annotated data, are far more limited. And this is because it's often very expensive or impractical to annotate data. And as a result, there is great interest for unsupervised or self-supervised approaches, which can leverage unlabeled data, and also for methods that are data sample Okay, so why is it a good idea to use transformers for multivariate time series? Well, first of all, transformer architectures have had remarkable success in the field of natural language processing. And this is for a very good reason. They possess certain distinct advantages, which I believe translate very well to the field of uh, time series. Um, so for example, they can concurrently and selectively attend over a long context of input sequence elements. And importantly, they do this by treating each element of the input sequence on equal footing. So they don't treat elements near the middle and the beginning and the end of the sequence differently, which is not the case with LSTMs, for example, even bidirectional LSTMs. And furthermore, they have multiple attention heads, which means that they can actually consider multiple aspects of relevance between uh, input sequence elements. For example, some, uh, some of these attention heads may specialize to consider the relationship between a specific subset of uh, input variables. And in case the signal consists of multiple periodicities, so it is different uh, frequencies, different important frequencies, then some attention has may actually tune into recognizing uh, these different periodicities. Now, a very important factor so, uh, um, that contributed to the success of transformers in natural language processing is their effectiveness for unsupervised uh, pain. So in fact, Currently, the state-of-the-art, all state-of-the-art models in natural language processing rely on unsupervised pre-training. And there are different objectives that can be used for this pre-training. For example, denoising, the input masking and then unmasking uh, the input, as well as what is called language modeling uh, in natural language processing, which is predicting the continuation of a sentence, which is akin to forecasting uh, in time series. However, they are not exactly well known for in data sample addition. Quite the contrary, they basically they are infamous for requiring tons of data and then training for several weeks on hundreds of GPUs. 
So how well are they going to perform on the relatively small data sets that are available for multivariate analysis? So far, transformers consisting of a full encoder-decoder architecture have been exclusively used for supervised learning and in varied time series, and in particular for the specific task of forecasting and missing values in computation. By contrasting this work, we aspire to develop a generally applicable methodology framework that leverages unlabeled data by first pre-training a transformer model and then using transfer learning, supervised learning, and then apply it on several downstream applications. Uh, which include univariate forecasting and missing values computation, but also tasks such as classification, regression, anomaly detection, and many others. Finally, it's time to look at the architecture of the model we use in our method. And immediately we notice that, unlike the original transformer architecture, here there is no decoder. This is because the original transformer architecture was intended for a generative task, whereas here we also deal with non-generative tasks. So basically tasks such as uh, classification, where the output is not a sequence of variable length. So we start with our multivariate time series at the bottom, and we see that this can be seen as a sequence of distinct vectors of dimensionality m, which is the number of variables that we have at different time steps. So first, we need to linearly project these vectors to a vector space of different dimensionality, E, which is the number of dimensions of the internal representations of our transformer model. And this is a design hyperparameter uh, of the model, which is best tuned, taking into consideration um, what data set we're dealing with. So on top of these vectors, we add positional encodings in order to make our model aware of the order of the input sequence elements. Otherwise, transformers are permutation invariant. So unlike the original transform, um, here the positional encodings that we use are fully learnable parameters. And now that we have our input, we can finally uh, add um, transformer blocks several of them, um, potentially, one on top of the other. And finally, at the output of the final transformer encoder block, we get the final representations shown here as purple rectangle. Now, the computational complexity of the transformer depends on the square of the input sequence length. So in case we have very long um, time series, then we can follow a hierarchical approach. For example, we can use a 1D convolutional layer to do a smart downsampling of the input. And at the output of this 1D convolutional layer, we now have another sequence uh, of less uh, samples, of a smaller number of samples, depending on the stride that we use. Uh, maybe we use dilations and, and so on. Um, and also of different dimension now. And now this serves as the input to our uh, transformer encoder. So we additionally pre-process the data uh, during variable-wise normalization, which means we subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation of each variable. And on top of that, we also use uh, batch normalization instead of layer normalization, which is what is used in transformers uh, for natural language processing. Now, the intuition behind this is that, first of all, layer normalization can be seen as a cheap approximation of batch normalization. And secondly, the reason why layer normalization works better for natural language processing, as has been shown in recent work, is due to the specific statistics of natural language sentences. Um, the statistics we have here from multiple time series are quite different. And in fact, there are several occasions where batch normalization would help with uh, outlier samples. Now, let's see how we do pre-training. Essentially, we apply a mask 
on the input time series sequence, which you see depicted here as gray blocks. We zero out the corresponding sequence elements. And now we ask our model to predict what were the hidden mask values at the position we have masked. So in particular, we predict at each time step the entire input vector, but only the masked elements enter the loss function, which is the mean squared error. However, the way that we select which elements to mask matters. If you think about it, if you naively select uniformly at random, for example, using a Bernoulli distribution um, elements to mask, then most times it will be trivially simple for the model to predict what the missing values are, just replicating the value uh, on its left or on its right, or maybe taking the average between them. Instead, we want to make the task more challenging by masking a long enough segment of the input sequence. And in general, we want to encourage the model to learn to attend to the past and the future of the hidden segments. But also, we want to model dependencies between different variables. So the way that we do that is by separately masking a proportion r of each variable. This r, we actually found that something around 15% works best. And we use a Markov chain with two states, masked and unmasked, so with different transition probabilities, which are selected in a way to give us an average length of L, which we chose to be three, which corresponds to masked segments, each followed by an unmasked segment. So here I'm showing you a comparison between four different masking schemes. And highlighted with blue, you see the schema I just showed you, which overall works best across data sets. Um, the other schemes are, the first one is separately masking its variable using a Bernoulli distribution. The second one is synchronously masking um, variables using a Bernoulli distribution. What synchronous means you can see at the bottom right. Basically, it means hiding the entire uh, input vector, so all variables at once. And the final column corresponds to synchronous masking and also stateful, so using uh, a Bern um, Markov chain for the temporal evolution of the mask. Ultimately, which scheme works best will also depend on the data that we have. For example, in case there is no dependency between variables, uh, as is the case uh, for the insect wind beat data set, where different variables correspond to different frequency bands, then maybe the synchronous uh, masking will work best because we don't need to model dependencies between variables. And instead, what is more important is to examine the temporal context. Now that we have a pre-trained model, we can use supervised learning to fine tune. it. So we apply the model on a multivariate time series. Then we extract the output final layer representations and we concatenate them. And we can simply now use a dense output layer to get a prediction. So in the case we have a regression problem, this prediction directly enters the mean square error loss. In case we're dealing with classification, we pass this value through a softmax, and then we use cross-entry. So how well does this work? Well, you see here a comparison between the state-of-the-art methods currently on six different regression data sets. Our models correspond to the last two columns one for a model trained only through supervised learning and one for a model which has been first retrained. And you see that out of the six data sets, they achieve best performance uh, on four of them and second best performance on the remaining two, which gives them an average rank of about 1.3. By contrast, no other method uh, manages to score consistently well across uh, data sets and stand out. The second best method was XGBoost 
it achieved an average rank of 3.5. Now, interestingly, the three deep learning methods, uh, ResNet, Inception, Architecture, and Fully Convolutional Network, did fairly poorly. And also interestingly, we see that most of the diseases are actually quite small. For example, Applies', applies this Energy um, has only about 96, less than 100 uh, training samples. Now let's look at how pre-training can help performance. Imagine we have a data set of a certain size. Here we use the one with the most data samples, which is only partially labeled. So here we restrict the number of labels artificially to 10%. And progressively, we're adding more labels. So as you can see, and as is expected, the model that has been trained through supervised learning gets better and better as we add more labels. But importantly, the model that has been first pre-trained on all available data samples, including the unlabeled ones, performs better always across the entire uh, range of uh, label available, at least for this data set. Crucially, we see here that doing unsupervised pre-training can lead to the same performance benefits as increasing the number of available labels by a factor of four. Now we ask a subtly different question. What happens if we don't vary the number of label data, but unlabel data, which are available for unsupervised pre-training? So zero in the horizontal axis corresponds to purely supervised learning. And then we progressively add more and more unlabeled data, which are used for unsupervised pre-training. And we see that both for 10% annotation level and also 20% annotation level, the more unlabeled data we use, the better the performance. Now let's look at classification results. We observed that on seven out of the 11 multivariate classification data sets we have examined, our models, the first two columns, perform best and achieve an average rank of 1.7. In particular, we see that they perform especially well on very high dimensional data sets, as well as data sets with a relatively higher number of training samples. By contrast, they seem to be relatively weaker when it comes to very low dimensional time series. So three out of the four times where they weren't best, the data set was only three dimensional. And my hypothesis is that the reason for this is that in low dimensions, the positional encodings can destructively interfere with the input vectors. And also that the self-attention mechanism encounters difficulties with low dimensional input. Finally, I'm showing you some qualitative results on imputation of missing values. And the original signal is depicted as a continuous blue line. The hidden mask values are shown as light blue circles and the most predictions are depicted as orange dots. And the bottom left grid, each column corresponds to a different signal dimension and its row corresponds to a different sample. And we can observe that the model can do a very decent job predicting the hidden values, even in cases where we have rapid transitions in the signal or where we have a contiguous segment masked and missing. To conclude, I have shown you how a transformer encoder architecture can be used as a framework for multivariate time series representation learning. And we have seen that it uses unsupervised pre-training through input masking and denoising. It can offer substantial performance benefits over fully supervised learning. And interestingly, it can do so even without additional unlabeled data. So simply by reusing existing data samples. We've seen that it performs significantly better than the state of the art for regression and classification. And again, interestingly, even for data sets which only contain a few hundred training samples, is not necessarily expected of transformer architectures. By doing so, it becomes the first self or unsupervised method which pushes the limits of the state of the art for regression and classification. And finally, something that I've not demonstrated in the current presentation, this method is computationally tractable, especially on a GPU. Thank you very much.